Greetings and salutations, ladies, menfolk, and non-binary viewers. Welcome to a new episode of Game Break. An ongoing series where me and my crew take a break from our creative endeavors and play some video games. Or in my case, visual novels. We're taking a break from World and Economica and trying out another one called Everlasting Summer. Now this one is Russian, so there may be some interesting phrasings going on via translation, we'll see. I've heard a lot of interesting things about the branching storylines in this one, and that is some really kick-ass background music. I like that. I was going to say some of the story endings are apparently very engaging or emotionally uh, instigating. So, I'm not quite sure what we're going to end up with or how it'll go, but I'm intrigued. I'm looking forward to it. Let's do this thing. I was having that dream once again. That dream. Same thing every night. But it's all forgotten in the morning, as usual. Maybe it's for the best. Only a glimpse of memory will remain, of gates half opened, as if inviting me somewhere, with two frozen stone pioneers standing close by. And also, that strange girl who keeps asking me. Darkness? Will you come with me? Come? But where? And why? And where am I, anyway? Of course, if it all happened in real life, I would certainly have been scared. Well, what else would one expect to feel? But this is just a dream. The same one I see every night. There must be a reason. You don't have to know where or why to realize something is really happening. Something desperately seeking my attention. Uh, I can put this in the corner a little bit. Since everything that surrounds me here is real. As real as things in my own flat, I could open the gates, hear the hinges creak, brush the crumbling rust away from my, with my hand, inhale the fresh cool air and shiver from the cold. I could, but to do that, I would need to pick myself up, take a step, move my hand. But this is a dream. I understand that, but what of it? What does my understanding change? Because here it's just like on the other side of the cracked screen of an old TV, which struggles to fight against static noise and strives to show its audience everything without missing a single detail. But the picture is getting blurry. I must be waking up soon. Maybe I should ask her something. The girl. What's her name? About the stars, for instance. Why the stars, though? I'd rather ask about the gates. Yes, the gates. She would be so surprised. Or better, why the dot over an I was called a tittle, but the dot over a J was called a superscript dot? That is actually a very interesting question in regards to typography and the history of language and all that. But is she really going to have the answer? Because if so, that would be pretty cool. 
nice letters, as if they don't exist anymore. Still, what do letters, gates, and stars have to do with this place? Because even if I'm having this dream every night, which will be forgotten soon anyway, I've got to look for answers here and now. And there, if you look carefully, you can see the Magellanic clouds, as if I'd ended up in the southern hemisphere. In a dream, there are the small things that catch your attention. An unnatural color of grass, impossible curves of straight lines, or your own distorted reflection, while the real danger, which could put an end to everything right here and now, seems trivial. It's natural, since here you cannot die. I know it for sure. I've done it hundreds of times. But if you cannot die, is there a point in living? I should ask the girl. She's a local. She should know. Yes, exactly. I should ask her about the owl, for example. One strange bird it is. Though, it doesn't matter. Will you come with me? And every time I have to answer. It's the only way, otherwise the dream will never end, and I will never wake up. Oh! Choice right off the bat, okay. No, I'll stay here, yes, I'll come with you. Uh, dream world. Every time, it's so hard to decide on an answer. Where am I? What am I doing here? Who is she? And why does so much of my life depend on this answer? Or maybe it doesn't. It's just a dream after all. Just a dream. That's a little blurry. Oh, hey, not anymore. Now it is. Still blurry. Now it's not. That... What is going on? Okay. The computer screen stared at me as if it was alive. Sometimes it really did seem to me that it was conscious of itself, had its own thoughts and wishes, ambitions, that it had feelings, could love and suffer. As if in our relationship the screen wasn't an instrument it was me who was a lifeless piece of plastic and textilite. There is some truth in that, probably because the computer provides 90% of my communication with the outside world. Anonymous image boards, some chats from time to time, rarely ICQ or Jabber, and forms even more rarely. People on the other end of the internet cable simply do not exist. All of them are simply creations of its sick imagination, an error in the source code or a kernel bug which started living a life of its own. It's an interesting theory. That's not a computer. Is that the ceiling? A very blurt. That, yeah, that's a ceiling. Okay. If one looked at my existence from the outside, such thoughts would seem crazy, and a psychologist would surely give me a bunch of sophisticated diagnoses and maybe write me a doctor's referral to the loony bin. Hmm. 
Interesting way to transition around. A small apartment, with no signs of repair or any semblance of order in it, and always the same view out the window of on the gray mega megalopolis, running somewhere day and night. Such are the conditions of my life. Well, of course, it didn't all start like this. I was born, went to school, and finished it, like all the others. I was accepted at a university, where I spent a year and a half trailing behind and struggling. I had drifted through several jobs. Sometimes it was working out quite well. Sometimes I was even getting decent money for it. But it all felt like it was not mine, as if taken from another man's biography. I wasn't living life to its fullest. It was looping over and over in monotonous circles. Like in the movie Groundhog Day. It's just that I had no choice in how to spend my day, and every day repeated itself. The same vicious sp spiral. A spiral of emptiness, misery, and despair. But nice background music, at least. For the last few years, I just sat in front of the screen all day. Sometimes there were menial jobs. Sometimes my parents helped me. All in all, I was able to provide for myself. No wonder, really, since my needs are quite minor. I hardly ever leave my home, and my communication with other people almost exclusively consists of online correspondence with the anonymous who have no real name, no gender, no age. So, in brief, a quite typical life of a quite typical antisocial person of his time. Kind of Donnie Darko on a minor scale, without doomsday-related visions. Maybe some highly respected author will write a novel about me, and it will become a contemporary classic of modern literature. Or... I will write one myself. However, what's the point of fooling myself? I tried many times, but couldn't even come up with a simple short story. I tried to learn many other things as well. Not gifted enough to draw. Programming? Got bored. Foreign languages? Mm, takes too much time. The only thing I loved doing was reading, but still, I never would have called myself a scholar. Perhaps I was an ace at watching anime and a grand master of lame internet jokes. If I were to get paid for it, I would probably be a happier person, and a richer person too, but I doubt it would fill the hole inside me. That's a nice view. That's really nicely done. Today was another typical day of a typical failure's typical life. And today is the day when I have to go to my university reunion. Frankly speaking, I really didn't want to. What is the point? The time I spent with them was so short. However, I was persu persuaded by a friend my former university mate, and one of the few with whom I kept in touch other than through the internet. Slightly different image style, okay. Kind of uh, graphic novel-esque. Is that me? Goodness, I need a shave. A frosty evening, but bus stop, waiting. I never liked winter, though hot summer is not my season either. 
It's just that I see no reason to point out any particular time of the year. Doesn't matter much what the weather is outside when you stay at home 24-7. The bus today was running so late that I was about to curse it all and spend my last few hundred rubles for a taxi. The idea of just returning turning home didn't cross my mind for some reason. As usual, millions of thoughts flew through my mind, but there was not a single useful one to seize on. Such a thought that you could bring into existence, give a shape, turn into an idea and put into practice. Maybe I could start my own business. But where would I get the money from? Or maybe I could go back to working in an office. No, no way. Maybe I should try freelancing. But what skills do I have and who would want me after all? I suddenly remembered my childhood. Or rather, my teen years. The time when I was 15 to 17 years old. Why exactly those years? No idea. I guess it's because back then everything was much more simple. It was easier to make decisions, so complicated now and so simple then. Waking up in the morning, I knew exactly how my day was going to pass, and I always eagerly looked forward to the weekend. Then I could get some rest and have time for the things I liked. Computer, football going out with friends. And then, at the beginning of next week, I'd take up my studies again. Back then, there were no such worrying questions like why, who needs it, what will change if I do it, or what will not change. A simple lifestyle, so casual for any normal person and so odd to myself today. That careless childhood age. It was also then that I met my first love. Her appearance and personality have vanished from my memory. Only her name remains, like a brief line from a social network profile, along with the feelings which overwhelmed me when I was with her. Affection, tenderness, the desire to care for her and to protect her. Sadly, it didn't last long. Today, I can hardly imagine something like that happening. I would probably like to meet a girl, but I don't know how to start a conversation, what on earth to discuss, and how to attract her. Well, I haven't met any suitable girls for a long time. But where could I meet one, anyway? The sound of an engine brought me back to reality. A bus pulled over. There was something abnormal about it, I thought. Then again, it doesn't matter, only the 410 runs this route. Well, that's kind of an ominous image. So is that. Uh... Street lights pass me by. It's as if their cold light sparks inside of me, trying to ignite feelings long dead. Or maybe not ignite, just awaken them. Because those feelings, they have been living in me for a long time, slumbering and waking up again. The driver's radio was playing some very familiar tune, but I wasn't listening to it. I was watching the cars passing by through the fogged up window. Because people are always rushing somewhere, chasing something they need, stuck in their own little worlds, why would they care about mine? They probably have their own serious problems, or maybe they have much easier lives. You can't know for sure, since all people are different. Or are they? Sometimes, someone's actions can easily be predicted, but if you try to look inside his soul, you will only see impenetrable darkness. The bus was approaching downtown, and my thoughts were interrupted by the bright city lights. Hundreds of billboards, 
thousands of cars, millions of people. I watched this light show and somehow I got terribly sleepy. My eyes closed just for a moment and then... Cool. Oh, hi. Uh, okay. Intro, I guess. So that's two. I can't read Russian characters. Okay. person with cat ears in the front. Well, that's a nice little intro. Very nicely done. Day one. Bright daylight struck my eyes. At first, I didn't pay attention, as I wasn't fully awake yet. On their own, my legs carried me towards the door. Damn, looks like I fell asleep and missed my stop. And it looks like my name is Semyon! But there was no door. Wait, what? I looked around the bus and realized that it wasn't a good old worn out L-I-A-Z. Instead, the bus was an Icarus model. A new one. I froze in shock. How? What? Am I dead? Have I been kidnapped? No. I must be dead. I patted myself down feverishly. Slapping myself painfully in the face a few times, banged my forehead on the back of one of the bus seats. It's clear. Either I'm still alive, or you can still feel pain when you're dead. But how could this happen? Maybe I slept for too long and ended up at the bus depot? And then what? Did they put me on an onto another bus? I rushed out and took a look around. Greenery wherever I looked. Tall grass on the roadside, trees, flowers. Summer. But how? It was winter just a moment ago. My head was aching unbearably. Well, you did just smash it on a seat, so what do you expect? As if it was going to explode. Slowly, I began to remember. What am I remembering now? A long road running off into the distance. Forests, plains, fields, lakes, and forests again. I think I was sleeping, but then how can I remember all of it? And then... A gap. Some girl leaning over me? She softly whispered something into my ear. Then a gap again. And then I woke up here. 
we in Welcome to Night Vale or something? Who was that strange girl? Or was she just a dream? For some reason, thinking about her made me feel better and calmed me down a little. I felt warmth all over, coming from inside. Hey now. Could it be her who brought me here? You never know. Then I need to find her. And the best place to look for her is away from here. I rushed to the left, then to the right, then stopped, hesitating over where to go. Finally, I ran in the direction from which the bus had probably came. Physical exercise does refresh one's mind. Thoughts become clearer, and it gets a little easier to evaluate the surrounding reality. Not in my case, however. I was sitting on the roadside, wheezing, and trying to ease my sore throat by gulping breaths of hot air. In any case, the run did its job. The fear withdrew for a while. Maybe I really am just dreaming. Though recalling my self-harm on the bus, I immediately rejected the idea. I am neither dreaming nor dead. A narrow road ran through the field and far into the distance. That exact same road from my dream. I must be very far away from home. And it's not just that it was winter yesterday and it's summer now. It's the whole environment. Of course, summer is usually like this, green and hot. But here, everything is not entirely lifelike. Everything looks like it was taking, taken from the paintings of Russian landscape artists of the 19th century. The grass is just too lush. The bushes are not like what bushes should be. They are so thick that you can't see anything through them. Like treetops, honestly. And the trees themselves? The forest was quite far away, but the trees looked as if they had closed their ranks and were now just waiting for the order to advance onto the fields and plains. I caught my breath and looked at the bus, which was now barely visible. That was a good run. Fear overtook me once again. Those power lines. There must be people here. But what does it mean? In fact, no, that means nothing at all. Couldn't they have power lines even in hell? Eh, makes sense. Roasting sinners over hot coals? That's so last century. I must have reached the point of no return, after which you should either lose your mind completely or finally try to understand what's going on. And while I still have a choice, I should pick the second option. I slowly headed back to the bus. Of course it was scary. But I'm not likely to find an answer in the fields or the woods, and this wretched bucket of bolts is the only kind of link that I have with the real world. I should carefully scout out the area. Sav Savoyanok means outlet. A brick wall and its gates crowned with a Savoyanok sign statues of pioneers standing on either side, and a road sign nearby showing the bus route number, 410. So, it's an owlet sign. Okay. The trip's taking a bit too long today. I smirked. A person may start acting inappropriately in extreme situations. Something like that is probably happen happening to me right now. This place doesn't look abandoned at all. No rust on the gates, no damage to the walls. Savionok. What could have a name like that? Judging by the pioneer statues, it could be a kid's summer camp. Moreover, it appears to be open. Of course, the simplest explanation, logically speaking, explains nothing at all. The strange girl, the altered bus, summer, 
the pioneer camp. Thousands of theories went through my mind instantly, from alien abduction to lethargic sleep, from a hallucination to a time and space shift. None was worse than any other, but there really was no way to pick a single one. Then it occurred to me, I can try to make a phone call. I took out my cell phone and dialed the first number from my contact list. But instead of signal strength bars, the screen was showing a thick cross. Alright, there may be no si signal in such a remote place. Though I cannot be the only one who came here. Buses don't drive themselves. I examined the bus from all sides to make sure it wasn't a hallucination. Bits of dirt on the bottom, some rust here and there, faded paint and worn out tires. No, this is definitely a very ordinary Icarus. Yeah, exactly the kind of bus which takes you to places beyond your understanding if you carelessly fall asleep. I gave a nervous chuckle. Came out by itself, sporadically. Because this wasn't the right place or time to laugh. But where on earth is the driver? I cautiously sat down on the curb beside the bus and started to wait. My patience didn't last long. My anxiety seems to have reached its peak and I started to go slightly mad. In such a situation, anyone would have probably felt something similar. Aliens and parallel universes were gone from my imagination, leaving only void and darkness. Is this how everything will end? How my life will end? But I wanted to do so much. There were so many things that I had no time for yet. I was overwhelmed by the idea. This was definitely the end. But why? It's not fair. Surely I'm no worse than anyone else. God, why? Are you narcoleptic or something, always falling asleep with your eyes and whatnot? Tears were burning my eyes unbearably. I curled up and started rolling in the grass. Why? What did I do? Why me? But my cries were only heard by the speechless statues of the pioneers and a bird on the tree, which immediately flapped its wings and took off, crying out something in its own bird language, as if laughing at the idiot who dared to interrupt its after-dinner nap. I was left breathless from weeping and just lay quietly sobbing occasionally. After a while, I managed to pull myself together. My mind cleared up a bit, as if terror and the fear of death gave me a little break. All in all, if someone wanted to kill me, what is all this for? It doesn't look like an experiment, either. If this is just some crazy coincidence, then there's probably no threat. Anyway, for now, it seems there's no danger. The panic was soon gone. Of course, the blood was still pounding in my temples and my hands were still shaking, but at least I could think clearly now. Right now, there's nothing I can really change anyway. So no matter how much I think or how mad I get, it would only make things worse. Until some actual facts appear, there really is no point in making guesses. In any case, I won't learn anything by lounging about here. This camp if, of course, it really is a camp, looked like the only place where people could be, so I decided to go there. Hardly had I reached the gates when a girl came out from behind them. Wearing a pioneer uniform. My logic didn't let me down this time. Then again, a pioneer uniform in the 21st century? And then again, a girl... Here? I froze, unable to take a step. I felt very much like running away. Running as far away as I could from this place, far from this bus, gates, statues, and far from this 
bloody bird with its siesta. Just running, free like the wind, faster and faster, waving to the planets passing by, winking at the galaxies. Running, becoming a pulsar ray and turning into vestigial, vestigial radiation, running to face the unknown. Run, no matter where, as long as it is far away from this place. Meanwhile, the girl came closer and smiled. I could not help but notice her beauty, even though I was trembling in fear. Human instincts work independent of consciousness, and while only 5% of the brain is responsible for cognitive processes, the remaining 95% are always busy sustaining life, and in particular ensuring stable functioning of the hormonal system. I desperately wanted to get less complicated and stop thinking in formal quotes from an encyclopedia, though my thoughts appeared one by one, being stupid, out of place, as if taken from an internal monologue of the hero of some junky softcover crime fiction book. A pretty Slavic face, long braids that looked like two armfuls of fresh hay, and blue eyes you could drown in. Hi, you must have just arrived? Uh, reply? Um, yeah. All right then, welcome. She smiled broadly. Strange, it looked as if I had just a normal girl in front of me. Bah, I shouldn't have returned here. The woods and fields seemed better. But... What should I do next? Try to speak with her as if she was a human, or run away, or what? The blood was pumping unbearably in my head, tearing it apart from the inside. A little more, and the poor pioneer girl would be splattered with the gruesome contents of my skull. What's so funny about that? The girl looked me over. It sent shivers down my spine, and my knees started to tremble. N nothing Great, then. Great? What's so great about that? Suddenly a thought crossed my mind. To hell with it all. Forget about the bus behind me, the fact that it was winter yesterday and summer today. I wanted to rip off my itchy sweater and just accept that all this is actually happening. Everything is as it should be. All this is for the best. Would you happen to know... You should go to our camp leader. She'll tell you everything. Look, you go straight ahead to the square, then turn left. You'll see several small cabins. She pointed at the gates, as if I knew what was behind them. Well, oh, mm -mm -mm. I didn't get to read the little text bubble above me. Got it? Of course I didn't. Well, I've got to go now. Alright, so I have to be careful with my clicks if it's a really short sentence. The girl waved her hand at me and disappeared through the gates. It seemed as if to her I was something. Ordinary. And all this show with the bus and the travels while awake or asleep were troubling only to me. Well, everything here is just the way it's supposed to be. Camp leader, pioneer uniform. What, are they doing a historical reenactment here? I hope I won't find Lenin standing atop an armored car in this square. But even that would not surprise me right now. After standing alone for a while, I headed into the camp. A mere 50 meters ahead, a small, one-story house popped up on the left side. The sign near the door said, Clubs. I was about to come closer, when the door suddenly opened and a short girl wearing a pioneer uniform came out. Her pretty face gave me the impression of one suffering for the fate of the whole of mankind with a truly universal sorrow. As soon as she saw me, the girl froze, as if frightened. Am I that scary looking? Did I not shave? 
I froze too, considering what was the best to do. To approach first, or walk until she sowed some inif initiative. Or maybe run away after all. Although this last option was constantly being suggested only by my self-preservation instinct. At least that's what I'd like to believe. Not the worst human instinct, but far from the most logical. If this instinct played poker against deductive abilities, the outcome would be predetermined. And those deductive abilities, or at least their semblance, were hinting to me that there was no need to be afraid of this girl. Oh, there's another one. Suddenly, somebody jumped out of nearby bushes. A girl wearing a bright red t-shirt with USSR written on it. That says CCCP, not USSR. Such a perfect reproduction of the age. She looked quite short from a distance and was probably younger than both Pioneer Girls. The one at the gates and this girl at the door of the clubs. <laughs> at last I decided to come closer, but the USSR, as I called her in my mind, jumped towards the first girl and started telling her something while wildly waving her arms. The other girl in turn seemed confused and lowered her gaze, remaining silent. I would have probably continued to observe their amusing dialogue, but the USSR suddenly pulled something out of her pocket and started waving it in front of the first girl's face. Cricket! This something turned out to be a grasshopper. Ah, that was close. Hee! Can't go that high. The first girl squealed. She must not be too keen on insects, as she instantly rushed off towards the place where Lenin presumably made his speech about the workers and peasants' revolution. That is to say, towards the square. The USSR glanced at me, grinned playfully, and dashed after her. Not a bad start to the day. I have absolutely no clue where I am. Besides that, there are some kids here role-playing as pioneers. And, as far as I can tell, this place is located thousands of kilometers away from my home. It might even be a different reality. And this was indeed a reality. I mean, everything around me seems so real, if a little embellished, that I was starting to think that in fact my previous life could have been just a dream. And what am I supposed to do now? I was picking at the cracked paving stones with my shoe and staring aimlessly at the club's building. Just a few more seconds before I have to come up with some decision. That's when I recalled myself rolling on the grass, weeping. I cringed in disgust. Perhaps it's another instinct. When all energy for whimpering and self-pitying is used up, the body either goes into hibernation or mobilizes its reserves. Mine seemed to have chosen the second option, because out of the blue, I found the determination to figure out what was going on. And in order to do that, I had to act like a man, like a human, to maintain the dignity of a representative of my own world. I followed the path to the left, on the right side of which stood small cabins, apparently the homes of the local pioneers. Actually, they looked quite cozy from the outside. Even though I was born in the Soviet Union, I had never been part of its children's organizations, neither the pioneers or even the younger October children. I imagined the daily life of a typical pioneer camp a bit differently. Huge barracks with long rows of metal bunks, wake-up call at six o'clock played by a siren, one minute to make your bed, then joining the formation at the drill square. Or wait! Could I be confusing it with something else? Suddenly, something struck me on the back. I staggered but remained on my feet, turning around and prepared to fight heroically for my life. But all I found was another girl standing before me. And she looks pissed. My mouth hung open in surprise. Pick your jaw up off the ground! I closed my mouth. 
the same pioneer uniform, but the way she was wearing it looked, let's say, provocative? Like all the girls I had met here before, this one was rather cute, but her overly arrogant expression killed any desire to get to know her better. I'm gonna say she's a little scary, not arrogant. New here, are you? Fine, see ya. She threw a threatening glance at me and walked past. I waited for the pioneer girl to turn at the corner. Who knows what else she might have been up to. The most interesting things, thing was that even this hostile girl seemed completely normal to me. She did not give off the feeling of some deadly danger. Except maybe the danger of getting punched in the nose. At last I managed to make it to the square. There was no Lenin on an armored car, although one could easily expect something like that after all this had happened. Instead, however, a monument to a certain comrade towered in the middle of the square. The letters on the pedestal read G-E-N-D-A. Must be some big figure in the party. There were some small benches at the sides. It's quite pleasant here. Where did that girl tell me to go? To the left or the right? To the left? To the right? To the left? To the right? And why am I going there anyway? Uh, right. I've decided to pretend to be normal. So, to the right. Through a small grove, I came out at a pier. I must have taken a wrong turn. Hey! Wrong way! I turned towards the voice. That first girl stood before me. In a bikini. Now what did I tell you? Take a left at the square, wasn't it? She had changed from her pioneer uniform into a bikini. Oh, I still haven't introduced myself. My name is... Slavia. Actually, my full name's Slaviana, but everyone calls me Slavia. So you can too. Um, yeah. I still felt a bit confused, so I could not come up with a more meaningful answer. And, and what's your name? It felt like she could see right through me. Um, I... yeah, Semyon. Nice to meet you, Semyon. All right, I'm almost done here. Could you wait here a minute? I'm gonna change and we'll go to Olga Dmitrievna together. Agreed? Agreed. After this exchange, she ran off. I sat on the pier and let my feet hang into the water. I was wearing heavy winter boots, but in such weather there was nothing wrong in getting my feet wet. Furthermore, it let me cool myself a little. Looking at the river, I was brainstorming and processing everything that had happened. If this is some kind of conspiracy, it's a weird one. Even too friendly at times. No, it really looks more like a random event. Some entirely incomprehensible random event. Shall we go? Slavia was standing beside me, dressed in the pioneer uniform again. Let's go. I've been here for a very short time, but of all the people I've met, she looks the least suspicious. However, this fact is already suspicious itself. We walk to the square. The USSR girl and the girl who hit me on the back were there, chasing each other. Is this some kind of game they're playing? Ulyana, enough running! I'll tell everything to Olga Dmitrievna. Aye aye, Captain! How- Oh, there's gonna be so many high-pitched voices. I decided not to question Slavia for a while about what was going on or the local residents. Better meet with this mysterious Olga Dmitrievna first. Sounds like she's the boss here. 
We walked past the rows of almost identical cabins, some of which looked like fat beer barrels, while others looked more like household sheds. Finally, Slavia stopped in front of a smallish one-story cabin. It looked like an artist's painting. The faded paint, chipping here and there with age, was sparkling in the sun. The window shutters, slightly ajar, were swaying almost unnoticeably in the wind, and huge lilac bushes were growing at the sides. It seemed as if this ramshackle hut was drowning in a storm of purple silk, and the lilacs, like some elemental force, were inexorably destroying the troop leader's house. What are you standing around for? Let's go! Slavia snapped me out of my daydreaming. And, um, hmm. And stop teasing Lena already. Oh, goodness. Rena? Sounds like there's someone inside. Indeed, a moment later the door swung open and Ulyana ran out and dashed past with the same mischievous grin. Okay. The pigtailed girl came out next. Don't let it bother you, Lena. So her name is Lena. Gotta be thankful it's not Rena, at least. But I don't... Instead of finishing her sentence, she blushed and quickly headed towards the square. For some reason, I felt like turning and following her with my eyes, but Slavia said, Come. Alright, I'm going to cut it off there. And we're going to have to wait and see just what the hell is going on here. So I'm this dude, fell asleep on a bus, wakes up at a the equivalent of a summer camp for kids and they're all women meanwhile I'm a guy and it's a visual novel where is this going find out with me next week or two weeks from now depending on how I post all of these together but yeah until then Get back to being creative already! I could, but to do that, I would need to pick myself up, take a step, move my hand. But this is a dream. I understand that, but what of it? What does my understanding change? Because here it's just like on the other side of the cracked screen of an old TV, which struggles to fight against static noise and strives to show its audience everything without missing a single detail. But the picture is getting blurry. I must be waking up soon. Maybe I should ask her something. The girl. What's her name? About the stars, for instance. Why the stars, though? I'd rather ask about the gates. Yes, the gates. She would be so surprised. Or better, why the dot over an I was called a tittle, but the dot over a J was engaging or emotionally uh, instigating. So, I'm not quite sure what we're going to end up with or how it'll go, but I'm intrigued. I'm looking forward to it. Let's do this thing. I was having that dream once again. That dream. 
same thing every night. But it's all forgotten in the morning, as usual. Maybe it's for the best. Only a glimpse of memory will remain, of gates half opened, as if inviting me somewhere, with two frozen stone pioneers standing close by. And also that strange girl who keeps asking me. Greetings and salutations, ladies, menfolk, and non-binary viewers. Welcome to a new episode of Game Break. An ongoing series where me and my crew take a break from our creative endeavors and play some video games. Or in my case, visual novels. We're taking a break from World and Economica and trying out another one called Everlasting Summer. Now this one is Russian, so there may be some interesting phrasings going on via translation, we'll see. I've heard a lot of interesting things about the branching storylines in this one, and that is some really kick-ass background music. I like that. I was going to say some of the story endings are apparently very... called a superscript dot. It is actually a very interesting question in regards to typography and the history of language and all that. But is she really going to have the answer? Because if so, that would be pretty cool. Nice letters. As if they don't exist anymore. Still, what do letters, gates, and stars have to do with this place? Because even if I'm having this dream every night, which will be forgotten soon anyway, I've got to look for answers here and now. And there, if you look carefully, you can see the Magellanic clouds, as if I'd ended up in the Southern Hemisphere. In a dream, there are the small things that catch your attention. An unnatural color of grass, impossible curves of straight lines, or your own distorted reflection, while the real danger, which could put an end to everything right here and now, seems trivial. It's natural, since here you cannot. Darkness? Will you come with me? Come? But where? And why? And where am I, anyway? Of course, if it all happened in real life, I would certainly have been scared. Well, what else would one expect to feel? But this is just a dream. The same one I see every night. There must be a reason. You don't have to know where or why to realize something is really happening. Something desperately seeking my attention. Right, I can put this in the corner a little bit. Since everything that surrounds me here is real. As real as things in my own flat, I could open the gates, hear the hinges creak, brush the crumbling rust away from my, with my hand, inhale the fresh cool air and shiver from the cold. 